Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Data, Data Everywhere, using complexity analysis to find coherence in cancer big data. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Roche Diagnosis. As a global leader in healthcare, Roche Diagnostics offers a broad portfolio of tools that help healthcare providers in the early detection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. In molecular diagnostics, we are driven by a vision of working with laboratories like yours to improve the medical value you offer in microbiology, infectious diseases, oncology, and genomics. We continue to meet unmet needs through our investment in research, innovation, and scientific excellence with the goal of supporting your important role in improving patients' lives. To learn more, please visit usdiagnostics.roche.com. This presentation has been approved for continuing education credits. If you want to obtain credits for this presentation, please click on the Get Your Free CME CE Credits button located in the lower left of your screen. This will take you to a page listing all of our speakers and presentations. Select the appropriate CECME button under your presentation and follow the instructions to claim your certificate. Let's get started. You can pose questions to our speaker during this presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation and we'll try to get to as many as we can. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience any technical difficulties hearing or seeing this presentation properly, please let us know by clicking on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem through the green Q&A button. I would now like to present today's speaker, Dr. Kenneth Buteau. Dr. Buteau is a human genetics and genomics researcher who leverages computational tools to understand complex traits such as cancer, liver disease, and obesity. Dr. Buteau currently serves as Director of Computational Sciences and Informatics Program for Complex Adaptive Systems at Arizona State University and is a professor in the School of Life Sciences in ASU's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. For more information on Dr. Buteau's background, click on his name to see his experience. I'll now turn it over to Ken for his presentation. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the audience for uh, their joining in. Uh, I realize I'm batting somewhat clean up from the day's events. Uh, what I hope to do is, in, in the time allotted to me today, actually is introduce you all to the emerging concepts of uh, big, large-scale data associated with uh, uh, in the cancer community, uh, and hopefully give you some interesting new ideas as to how we might go about embracing this big data to help us solve some of the complex problems associated with cancer. So as this community, I think, is more than aware, we're in uh, an, a, an unprecedented window in which we're collecting phenomenal amounts of data. Shown on the current slide is, is an, actually an old figure from 2012 that suggested that uh, we, we would have tens of thousands of copies of the human genome that actually help us better understand uh, complex diseases such as cancer. Much of the sequencing is being driven by cancer. What we see is, in fact, that we have well overshot those numbers when we look at the uh, actual number of sequences as the end of last year. Almost uh, 300,000 human genomes have been sequences, much, uh, uh, much in the cancer community as a way to help us both understand the underlying etiology of cancer, but also to help us uh, drive a next generation of, of diagnostics. That said, uh, what we're seeing is a very large collection of raw data. And to leverage a, a story, a, a quick metaphoric story of, of a young girl who uh, wanted, wanted, wanted to have a pony, uh, when she came out uh, in, um, uh, on the day of her birthday, saw a large pile of manure uh, in the, uh, uh, on her driveway, and then uh, uh, immediately jumped in and her parents to that end said, why did you jump in? And they said, 
there must be a pony in there somewhere. And arguably, our large scale accumulation of this data uh, promises uh, that there must be a cure for cancer in there somewhere. This promissory note is actually being driven by the large scale personalized and or precision medicine revolution. And again, as this audience knows, per personalized or precision medicine is about delivering to the right individual the right care at the right time and in the right place, tailoring their therapeutic interventions to the molecular etiology of their disease. This clearly is both revolution uh, in the sense of our capacity to uniquely tailor our interventions to the characteristics of, their, of an individual's disease, but arguably it's also renaissance and renaissance in the form that uh, much the same as the old country doctor used to know all of the unique characteristics of the patient, not only their disease, but also their, uh, their personal preferences, their uh, cultural background and could tailor their interventions around this. And in fact, the new emerging big data in cancer is helping us both have revolution and renaissance. But let's focus on the molecular piece of this for a second, the precision medicine revolution that uh, is before us. Uh, shown here is a, is a cover of time, literally with the poster child of personalized medicine, Gleevec, suggesting that we actually were at a tipping point uh, in our understanding and our ability to treat cancer. And while unequivocally, there are these new precision medicine guided therapeutics have been tremendous successes. It's also important to recognize that they have their limitations. And shown on this slide is a, 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 another current uh, uh, survival chart showing what actually happens with these targeted interventions. Uh, this is sunetinib. And what we can see is that unequivocally, there is an effect and an important effect associated with this disease uh, and with this newer intervention. But what we can also see in this instance is that the mean change in survival here is that of 20 weeks. So while there is a miraculous transformation of this individual's, uh, of individual's disease when treated with these targeted therapeutics, what we can see is that the large scale, that the effects are actually quite minimum and actually measured in, uh, in weeks uh, as opposed to years and certainly not a cure. And I guess more dishearteningly is that even though with great promise of these personalized treatments, we still see that the survival curves here uh, still, unfortunately, even with these mean improvements uh, are not necessarily uh, providing us the cures for cancer. And I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, uh, before the end of the talk is to what, well, I'll transition into now as to why that may be the case and show you that hopefully by taking slightly different strategies, we may get to a better outcome. So why is it the case that we continue to get these? Why is it that even with our precision medicine targeting that we're not actually getting the cures to cancer that we hope? And I guess I wanted to go with the fact that to be honest with you, cancer it's complicated. So while we have the promissory note that if we could find a key mutation in cancer and target that specific cancer, what, we'll find, what we find is that cancer is more complicated than this specific single individual mutation we might be targeting. So what do I mean by that? Well, first, as this group I'm sure is aware, Cancer, we now know from two or three now solid decades of molecular biologic investigation, is a disease that occurs with the uh, change in the genomic constitution of a collection of cells that goes from a normal state to a malignant state. But what's important in this is that what we see here is that this is not a mutation that occurs, but actually dozens, and in this instance, what I would indicate is while my cartoon only shows two or three, the molecular data indicates that there are literally dozens to hundreds of mutations that are occurring. More disturbingly is those dozens to hundreds of mutations actually um, um, uh, 
are different between any two individuals. so for instance, one woman with breast cancer may have one ah hundred different mutations that have occurred another woman with breast cancer will have one ah hundred but the overlap between these is small so there's a large collection of diverse things happening the other thing that we see that emerges is that these cells are actually also differentiating so it's not that there's one uniform clone of cancer cells emerging but in fact that cancer cysts cancer is creating a whole new organ or actually more accurately organism uh, within one that actually has dynamic properties that change over time. And I'll come back to that in a second. We also know that these mutations can occur in a variety of different ways. So obviously we can have DNA-based mutations where we have single point mutations, but mutations can also occur by changing large scale copies of the total number of variants that one would have, big chunks of DNA change. Uh, we can have changes in the gene expression. So again, no necessary change in the underlying nucleic acids associated with a gene. We just make more of the genes. Uh, we can see that there are non-nucleic acid-based means by which this happens, epigenetic modifications. We now know that outside of the gene-based genome, that in fact there's all sorts of alterations happening in what we used to describe as the 95% of the human genome that was junk. And in fact, important phenomena occur as a product of those components. Uh, and lastly, there's all sorts of things that aren't even in the nucleic acid or proteomic space that are being modified to cause or to accumulate in the developing cancer. So not a single mutation that has occurred or a oncogene, but dozens of changes occurring through many different molecular mechanisms. We also know that these particular collections of mutations actually have to alter specific processes. And what we can see on this slide is that there's, you know, six different processes being shown. And in fact, the, depending on how you want to categorize them, there's five, six, seven, eight different kinds of processes that cancer needs to change in order to develop. In this instance, though, while we put a single label for, say, for instance, telomere maintenance or evade apoptosis, what we realize is that there are complex biomolecular networks uh, that actually are responsible for these particular processes. Evade apoptosis isn't one gene or one phenomena, but it's a whole network of interconnected genes and signaling frameworks necessary uh, in order to actually have that process work. Similarly for telomere maintenance and cell cycle regulation. And what we can see is when we look at those hundreds of alterations, some of them DNA-based mutations, some of them uh, other forms of alterations, we can see that in individual one, we may target one particular member of the network. In individual two, we'll, char we'll target a different member of the network. In individual three, a different member of the network. So while the network is being disrupted, it's not being disrupted in the same way in all different, in different people. We also know that the, what's happening at the somatic level is only one dimension. Cancers occur within hosts. Hosts themselves have millions of genetic variations in them. So for instance, the DNA I inherited from my mom is different in a million different locations from the DNA I inherited from my dad. Those different constitutional differences uh, influence basic cellular processes ranging anywhere from angiogenesis to the basic cellular matrix to how my immune system can respond and also influence how my body and my and how the host sees the external world and modify things such as chemical exposures, viruses, nutrition, and how those all are influencing the development of cancer. So, so suffice it to say that while we precision medicine may be targeting a entity, cancer is complicated, or perhaps more appropriately, it's very complicated. So we ignore this complexity at our peril. And I think this has been well stated by uh, a paper last year in Cancer Cell by Robert Weinberg, uh, an initial proponent that if we could just find the oncogene or our tumor suppressor gene, that the cure for cancer was before us and that precision medicine would be an, you know, an unequivocal success. Uh, 
Weinberg has come to the point of recognizing that we, those simple answers just aren't producing the results that we would hope. Uh, and then in fact, it's essential that we go back to embracing the full complexity of cancer. So cancer is not only complicated, as I've just shown in the series of slide, it's complex. So again, reiterating and summarizing the previous point, it's hundreds of alterations that vary from individual to individual. Those, vary, those tumors are molecular, her, molecularly heterogeneous within an individual, and that heterogeneity changes over time in response to a variety of different a variety of different stimuli. So as we can see again at the bottom of this figure of this slide, we can see how the molecular constitution changes over time and the mutational composition of a tumor is different at time A uh, versus time B versus time C. Uh, each one of these has a different molecular constitution. By saying complex, I'm actually using this not in the general sense of the word, but actually in the precise sense of the word. Cancer is a complex adaptive system or complex system. And the significance of this is that means that cancer and the underlying etiology of cancer isn't driven by single isolated effects, but as with all complex systems, driven by relationships, interconnectedness of particular events that change over time as is implicit from what we said before, cancer actually learns and adapts uh, as, in response to particular conditions. And importantly, because it's based on these relationships, it can't be fully understood by taking apart the pieces and then reassembling them in an arithmetic way. It displays emergence. Uh, in this instance, the whole being more than the sum of the part. These relationships specify something that's more than one plus one. In cancer, one plus one equals three. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because unlike traditional approaches uh, to fixing things, you can't fix a complex system. Uh, because of the complexity of the interacting parts, what one needs to do is instead alter the trajectory of the system. Uh, and I'll come back in closing of, the, of where we're standing and where we're going with what appear to be newly emerging uh, approaches to cancer that are, quite that are quite successful over and above the precision medicine point of view. Uh, those therapies appear to be embracing this concept of altering trajectory rather than just fixing or eliminating the broken pieces. So if what we, what we really want to be doing from all of this large collection of data, that large pile of data that I mentioned before, is translating that data into information. Uh, to do that, we need to understand relationships between the data themselves. And more importantly, what we want is knowledge or evidence. And that allows us to not only understand those relationships, but what are the patterns of those relationships and how do they change over time? So what I'm gonna spend the rest of my talk talking about is how we're approaching the problems of understanding relationships uh, and understanding patterns and applying those to the cancer problem. So let's talk first with discovering and understanding relationships. So part of what we've been doing is embracing the inherent network structure of cancer, uh, specifically in the somatic variation of cancer to start with, but also in the germline variation, those two different components I showed a moment ago. So our approach to understanding somatic variation leverages uh, analytic approaches developed by my a uh, colleague, previous postdoc, uh, Salafroni, who's now at Barlon University. And in this instance, what we use is biologic networks or biologic pathways as our unit of analysis. We look not at individual genes, but actually combine the information from individual genes and look at how they are interacting, literally looking at the places where one plus one equals three to try to better understand what's emerging and what's developing in cancer. Uh, in particular, what we do is take 
and embrace this complexity by computing pathway scores, looking at existing canonical biological networks that we can achieve, that we recover from the literature, and then using, in this instance, the experiments I'm going to show right now, using RNA-seq data that's been normalized by standard tools, look and calculate how this state the presence or absence, the up or down of genes, uh, influences our works in the combination of network frameworks. The specific focus I'm going to describe here is how we were using how we're using RNA seq, uh, the transcriptional response uh, to evaluate a therapeutic intervention that's uh, being explored by colleagues uh, from Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, looking at progesterone treatment in cancer. So in this instance, as I mentioned, we're looking uh, in partnership with uh, Dr. Bodwe and his colleagues at Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, India. Uh, shown on the, uh, on the left-hand side of your slide is a sample set that we're looking at. But again, in an attempt to embrace the complexity, what we're going to analyze here is not just the individual genes, uh, but we're going to look at how those individual genes change uh, in the context of networks between those uh, in, in response to the treatment. But the other thing that Dr. Bodway uh, quite insightfully has done here is not only collect the cancer samples to see what has actually happened in them, but also collected tumor adjacent so we can see what's happening not just in the cancer, but also see what's happening in normal or uninvolved tumor associated with the cancer. And he's also done something that's very unusual, but I think that's interesting and important uh, that may be critical for us better understanding the molecular etiology of cancer. He's looked at what the actual effect of the surgical intervention is, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So, so we can not only look to see how the intervention is changing the gene expression profile, but we can also see how it actually changes the normal profile in individuals and how even the baseline intervention, the surgical process by which we uh, the, the tumors are being treated also changes things. So I'll start with the sort of basic intervention. And what, what I'm showing here is the outputs, the results of this, of this preliminary pathway analysis that's associated with surgical hypoxia. As this audience, as I'm sure, is aware, the first step one does when one does surgical interventions is to clamp off the blood supply to, to, to the tissue uh, that in which this tumor is being extracted. What we found here is, interestingly and importantly, is independent of any therapeutic intervention, independent of whether you're looking at tumor or normal in this instance, the very act of just clamping the blood supply to the tumor actually changes its molecular profile. And in this instance, we can see that several of the critically important genes that, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, molecular networks that have been associated with oncogenesis are, appear to be acutely sensitive, dramatically change their state just as the act of hypoxia. So again, uh, this may be important in helping us target and generate future interventions to realize that the state that we are treating is immediately changed. The state of the disease that we're, that we're treating is immediately changed just by doing the surgical intervention, uh, not, any other, uh, not any other sort of molecular or targeted intervention. So shown here is just some blow-ups of this in more cartoonish forms. I realize it's probably difficult to read the specific pathways, but to be honest with you, those are captured on the other tables. This is just graphically showing how the states of the network change as a product of the hypoxia. And you can see blue meaning that they, they have been turned off, red being that they've been turned on, and you can see relatively dramatic differences that are occurring at the summary state level of the pathways. We can also see that, interestingly, and the point of these next two slides is to show that the answers we get are different when we look at the pathway interactions as opposed to the specific genes. So here you can see what happens if we look at hypo hypoxic and non-hypoxic samples, uh, individual genes, that we can see individual genes, some small number of individual genes that change. But to be honest, uh, the pattern is not radically different uh, in the hypoxic 
versus the non-hypoxic. However, if we then look at the gene interactions, what we can see is that there are many more and profound differences that are occurring uh, in the hypoxic samples versus the non-hypoxic. So we can see radical changes that are occurring that have profound effects uh, on, uh, the, uh, on the scoring of the differences between uh, hypoxics and non-hypoxics. We can do a similar sort of analysis with respect to the non-tumor tissue. Again, traditionally not done in these, but what we can see is uh, dramatic network changes that occur as a product of the actual, in, uh, the, that's independent of whether you're cancer or not. So these are just baseline changes in normal cells. And knowing that these baseline state changes occur may be important in helping us understand how to actually minimize toxicity or to increase effectiveness. So we've now actually seen whole dimensions of the cancer that don't normally, that aren't normally being evaluated when we look at just simple uh, changes that occur in the tumor pre and post treatment. Uh, shown here is uh, again, the same effect in the tumors. Uh, and that what's interesting to see and difficult from this summary slide here where the pathway names are small, is that these pathways that we're seeing actually are different among the different combinations. So shown here is then a summary in a slightly more readable form that would show the specific pathways that are different within the pre and post normal treatment, pre and post tumor. So again, the accumulation of these actually gives us insight that we didn't have before. In this instance, insight as to how the act of doing surgery is changing the molecular state of the tumors and how actually the intervention itself changes not only the tumor or produces molecular changes not only in the tumor, but also how it's producing changes in the normal. And we believe the triangulation of this information will allow us to develop new, much more effective interventions. And then shown here, I'm sorry, this is just one more cartoon where we look at the differences between non-tumor and tumor without treatment, with treatment, uh, and similarly summary effects. So I'm now I'm actually shift my gears to actually looking not at the somatic tumor itself, but looking at the constitutional state. So as you recall in my opening comments, I indicated that we not only had two, there weren't only the importance of effects occurring within the tumor itself, but the host itself has, the individual in which cancer occurs, also has important characteristics uh, that are, that may change how, who develops cancer and how they would respond. So in this analysis, we're using uh, methodologies developed by uh, another one of my colleagues, uh, former students, uh, Rosemary Braun, uh, a, process, a process that looks at germline variation using pathways of distinction analysis. And basically uh, what this methodology does is allows us to look at how the molecular characteristics, the constitutional variable state uh, of an individual is different in individuals who have cancer versus individuals who haven't who don't have cancer. Our focus on this has been actually in looking at an unusual and emerging new collection of risk factors to developing cancer, that of diabetes. So let me spend a minute or two talking about this. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the exploding obesity epidemic that's occurring in the developed world. Uh, shown here is a slide that indicates that what that looks like. I think what most people are surprised by when they see this slide is not that we see high rates of diabetes or obesity in the United States or that we see such trends in Europe or in the developed world. What strikes most people in this is that we see these also in the developing world, India and China, and that granted both India and China have big numbers because they have big populations, what you'll also see in this is that, uh, and the underlying data for this indicates that their developing middle class and their uh, affluent class, the folks that actually are being exposed to Western diets seem to be particularly susceptible to the effects of obesity and diabetes. Uh, as this group is probably aware, uh, obesity causes many different types of phenotypes. What we're gonna focus on in uh, our 
analysis here is how might cancer be developing uh, and can we actually predict who is going to be developing cancer and what are the processes driving the development of cancer. Recently, uh, the role between uh, body mass index and obesity and cancer has been reaffirmed by a recent study in Lancet. Uh, in this instance, uh, we see that there are a number of tumor types uh, that are increased in incidence among obese individuals. What I'm going to focus my attention on in this talk in looking at genetic analysis is one particular type of cancer, that being liver cancer. And you might ask why. Well, the major reason I'm focusing on liver cancer has to do with concern that hepatocellular carcinoma, HCC, may become to this generation uh, what lung cancer was to a previous generation of individuals. That with the advent of obesity, that we may have an epidemic of liver cancer, similar to with the advent of smoking that occurred at the turn of the 20th century, uh, post-World War I and World War II, and the explosion of lung cancer, are we likely to see a similar sort of phenomena emerging for liver cancer? So why might I be saying that? Well, first, unlike many other cancers, uh, the vast majority of other cancers are either stable in incidence uh, per 100,000 or decreasing. Hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer is one of two cancers that has shown dramatic increases in uh, incidents over time. Shown here is a uh, work done by my colleague uh, Catherine McGlynn of the National Cancer Institute looking at SEER data. Uh, what's been observed is over the last 30 years, there's literally been a doubling in all racial groups uh, of liver cancer incidents. Uh, uh, the only other cancer showing dramatic increases is pancreatic cancer. Again, another obesity and diabetes associated uh, cancer type. What's been also fascinating and transformational that's occurred over the last three decades is we've seen a shift in the etiology of liver cancer, HCC, from its original driving forces, hepatitis C virus, hepatitis B virus, and alcohol or excessive alcohol consumption, which still have tremendously high odds ratios, tremendous relative risks associated with their incidence. But what's happened in this three decade period is we've seen now that the primary etiology of liver cancer is coming from obesity and diabetes. Uh, in this instance that now the attributable risk or the attributable fraction of liver cancer is no longer due to virus or alcohol exposure, but due to obesity. Uh, a tremendous shift in the change of the etiology. So we could be seeing a raising epidemic and part of our interest is trying to figure out who is going to develop liver cancer uh, among those in these exposed populations. The reason that obesity may be driving liver cancer is actually perhaps surprisingly straightforward. The liver is one of the primary places that, and early places that fat is deposited. It's actually a preferential location of fat deposition. Uh, it actually makes, uh, in terms of evolutionary adaptation, makes complete sense. Uh, the liver is the primary site of fat metabolism, so, uh, and where the processes, the biochemical processes necessary for, for fat metabolism occur. So not surprisingly, one would want to have it handy. What's interesting uh, is that uh, using evolutionary medicine thinking uh, is that over the adaptation period of humans, there's been very little selective pressure to figure out how to stop deposition of fat liver. So in fact, fat in the liver does, has very poor control mechanisms. So even when one is obese, the feedback loops that stop the deposition of uh, fat in the liver are relatively poorly developed. So, uh, so we teleologically understand why we are depositing fat in the liver. We still don't, though, don't understand why certain people go on to develop liver disease and others don't. And that's the purpose of our analytics. So in this instance, we've been doing germline variation analyses of, of 
study populations from Korea and China, looking at germ-wide, germ, uh, genome-wide germline variation uh, of very high density. Uh, and in these analyses, what we're seeing is that uh, we're finding, again, similar to what we saw uh, with our somatic cell analysis, is by analyzing networks, we're getting very strong signals that have uh, a 50% or more increase in developing liver cancer or looking at individuals who have liver cancer versus individuals who don't. We can, uh, we see pathways that have substantial uh, contributions to distinguishing those two, but the pathway state is very different in those two different sets of populations. Unlike what we would find with individual SNPs, we actually have very large uh, odds ratios uh, that are larger than one than even, than even the most significant individual uh, SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. Shown here is just the score of one of these that's important, uh, antigen processing and presentation. Uh, this is actually associated with the immune response. Antigen presentation and processing is the means by which uh, an individual's body recognizes self uh, and responds and regulates uh, the immune attack of one's own cells and or cancer. So it's interesting that one of the critical responses to fatty liver disease uh, is an inflammation response. So it actually makes uh, an, an, an interesting uh, uh, place to follow up that perhaps individuals who are developing uh, liver cancer have a different way that their immune system is responding to this fatty liver onset. So the next piece I wanted to focus on uh, is not just under uh, discovering and understanding the networks or the relationships, but how do we go about understanding the patterns? And for this, I'm going to focus on uh, the emerging uh, developing framework of successful cancer interventions in immuno-oncology. Uh, and immuno-oncology, I would argue, is a paradigm-shifting approach. And you'll see why as a student of complexity and complex adaptive systems, why I'm saying this. Uh, first off, why, are, why is immuno-oncology an exciting new advent and complementing and extending what perhaps the precision medicine revolution will do. Uh, first is that it has durable responses, unlike what I showed with the targeted therapeutics that are part of the precision medicine framework. Uh, we actually, one gets uh, durable responses associated with uh, the uh, application of immuno-oncology. Individuals actually for all intents and purposes, have responses that are measured in years and for all and perhaps are actually cured. Uh, the other interesting component is it's not tied to a single mutation or a single cancer type, but is in fact applicable to multiple cancer types. So why might that be the case? Well, one is an argument is that immuno-oncology is a conceptually different approach. What do I mean by that? Well, in traditional oncological advances from the very get-go, from surgery on through our targeted interventions that are part of the precision medicine portfolio, our approach has actually been direct action against the tumor. Surgically, we remove it. Chemotherapy, we kill it. Uh, and in uh, the um, targeted precision medicine, our goals are to retard its growth. Well, immuno-oncology actually approaches the problem differently. And in this instance, as I said before, how we intervene in complex systems, it actually alters the trajectory of a complex system. And it does this through the manipulation of the immune network. So immune, immuno-oncology and the immune system is itself a network. As this audience is aware, the immune system is a complex network of interacting components, and the immune system is itself also a quintessential complex adapting system uh, that, is inter that is interconnected, self-regulating, and has a dynamic interaction with the tumor itself. So what we've been interested in doing uh, in embracing this complex adaptive systems approach is developing computational models of how the immune system works. 
and how it might then interface with the tumor. And we're doing this through models and simulations. Our models and simulations are capturing uh, components that we know about the immune system and about oncology from the literature uh, and from specific reductionist experiments. Uh, and then we're looking through the analysis of this large collection of data, similar to what I just showed in the previous uh, analysis, to embrace the derived relationships that we can get from approaching these large collections of data. And then what we do is join these at interfaces to both solve specific equation sets uh, and to simulate, to, to get observed emergent properties, those one plus one equal three class outcomes. Uh, in this instance, we're embracing the community by ex uh, embracing the complexity by embracing both cancer and the immune response as a system, looking at them both together and understanding their dynamic relationship using computational modeling that's a combination of bottom up and top down strategies that extends other modeling approaches. So I know it sounds always a little radical when we say we're going to make computational models, but models are actually, computational models would be just yet one more tool in our armamentarium. Almost everything we know about cancer and almost any other complex trait uh, comes from our modeling approaches. Uh, and in this instance, what we want to be able to do is use computational modeling to realistically capture the same way we would do in a genetically engineered mouse or in a cell line, specific characteristics and see how those might work. Uh, our specific computational modeling captures in agent-based simulation uh, components interacting cells, immune cells, tumor cells, cytokines, receptors, and the environment in which these cells occur. Uh, we start with states based on what we can observe in the literature. We use mathematical models of cell migrations and cytokine diffusion and cell surface receptor movements. And then the idea is by using and examining how these all work, we can see emergent properties. So our strategy is to model the micro components, uh, molecules and solutions, specific receptor elements on cell types, different types of cell types and how immune cells come together, and then looking at uh, dynamic behavior, molecular diffusion or molecule diffusion, both in solution, how receptors move on particular cell types, how cells move in solution, or how they uh, interact with each other in matrix, for instance, in a tumor set, and then look for the specific biologic actions and reactions, both biologic and phenotypic. So we're looking for emergent macro behavior from the cell behaviors with given multiple receptors, how we get group action, how we get intracellular networks change in state and how the cell states themselves change and how we get differences in the immune cell population equilibrium. How do we get different characteristics and how do we actually see how the immune system may be acting to eliminate balance or how tumors may be manipulating the tumor, uh, may be manipulating the immune system so that they actually escape detection. So our simulation framework is actually looking, essentially uh, it's a large scale uh, uh, game in which we actually simulate uh, tumors and immune components all working and interacting with each other with different dynamics, just the same as the characters would in a large scale video game, uh, where we actually look and measure units over time. We capture the logic of systems uh, which can bind to each other uh, and can look at combinations of multiple receptor types, ligands, and different cell types. We calculate the dynamics using uh, partial differential equations uh, as shown in this slide so that we actually do both top down and bottom up agent modeling. But what we find, and this is probably a closing point that I'd like to make around the context of big data. So while I opened the talk with uh, discussions of the overwhelming volume of data that we're getting in genomic sequence, what we actually find is as we want to actually start to embrace the complexity of cancer and start to embrace its multi-dimensional nature, we realize that in fact, we are missing a lot of key pieces of data. So 
having big data in and of itself is not necessarily the sole answer to the question. Uh, we need to have the right kinds of data. So if we want to be actually embracing the complexity of cancer, we need to start having data not only on the specific components of the system, we need to have them collected in concert with each other. We need to know the immune profile uh, of an individual. We need to know the molecular state of multiple components, not just individual molecules. Uh, we need to have the data be able to be interconnected. And probably the most important piece that is missing from much of our molecular characterizations that we have accessible to us today is the need for having temporal data. We, very, we have very limited data that allows us to actually look at how these processes change over time. And as I again open with cancer as a complex system, we can see that cancer that we see today is not the cancer that we may have had yesterday and may not be the cancer that we would have tomorrow, both in terms of the molecular constitution of the cells and if we're interested in immuno-oncology, uh, how is the body responding to these specific interventions and how is uh, the cancer itself changing and changing the host in response. So I want to close and actually clearly hit a typo on this is that reductionist approaches to cancer are insufficient to obtain a full understanding of cancer. For us to actually truly move and have successful precision medicine that we all hope for, we need to have ways of looking at cancer as a system. Uh, not simply in the reductionist components, they are insufficient to understanding the whole, the full uh, portfolio of cancer. We need to actually see the components and how they are working together. Network analysis appears to bring coherence to chaotic individual levels of data. Uh, and through the, through the examination of these networks, uh, we seem to be able to get answers that we couldn't get at the individual levels. We actually think dynamic modeling through simulation may provide insights into complex emergent phenomena. Uh, we actually are quite optimistic that by creating a next generation set of computational models, we'll be able to enhance what we're doing with our current collection of wet lab molecular cell line or other animal-based models. But one of the critical challenges that's going to be facing the community as we go forward is not just collecting big data and not to say that big data, I'm a data analyst and we can and will find interesting ponies in the piles that we're examining. But if we truly want to make progress in personalized medicine and precision medicine, we may need to also embrace not just collecting more of the same, but making sure we're collecting the right kinds of data uh, to be able to ask and answer questions. So with that, uh, I want to acknowledge all the folks that have participated in this activity, say thank you, and actually would act and volunteer anyone. I'm looking forward to getting questions from the audience and anyone who's interested in collaborating, participating, contributing, or making suggestions as to how we might move forward, uh, please feel free to contact me because uh, we're always looking for partners in this arena. So with that, I'll turn the uh, microphone back to our moderator and look forward to interacting with you all in uh, answering questions that you might have. So thank you very much for your Thank you, Dr. Butel, for bringing that information to us. What a great presentation. I'll just remind our audience really quickly how they can submit their questions. Type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And we have one already. Um, Dr. Butel, an audience member, asks, what role do you think live cell imaging has in looking at cancer as a system? So I actually think live cell imaging and imaging overall is, is going to be the 
what are the next big explosions uh, in big data and in the phenotyping that we have. One, one of the challenges that we have today in the molecular frameworks that we're using is that they actually don't actually let us see what's happening to the cells per se. I think that the ability to be able to image and visualize uh, the specific cancer phenotypes is going to be trans Formational. It's yet another big data problem with all sorts of uh, interesting opportunities and challenges to extract the signals out of that big data. But we're confident that actually having that is going to allow us to pivot back and forth between what's happening at the molecular level uh, with particular cancers or particular cell types and their interactions and seeing what's physically happening at the cellular level. Great. Sounds like that's very interesting. Great. Um, another audience member has a question. Uh, your contact information. Uh, somebody wants to know how to contact you. Sure. So you can reach. Sure. So you can reach me at uh, Kenneth Buto. Kenneth dot Buto. K E N N E T H dot B U E T O W at A S U dot edu um, happy to actually interact with folks if there's a, a, a interesting further follow-up questions or ideas as to how we might be able to collaborate in approaching many of these individual problems so uh, i look forward to the opportunity to connect and interact with you all thank you for providing that Thanks so much for providing that information. For our audience member, we do have another question coming into our queue. Let me see here. Are there any software that you suggest to process time series data? So there's, there's a, actually a large portfolio of, data, of, of uh, time series software that uh, cap, that's captured actually in uh, my personal preference for many of these different types of software has is to use the open source community software because it allows us to actually exchange it uh, uh, straightforwardly. Uh, there are R modules and Python modules that uh, uh, are are readily available. I, I, I'm happy to, I won't be able to rattle them off at the top of my head, but there's a, a number of components. Certainly not to take anything away from my commercial uh, colleagues, you know, the folks at SAS also have uh, tools that facilitate uh, the analysis of time series data. Uh, our, our conceptual approaches for these are to, are to look at mixed model analysis. We actually think that uh, both linear and nonlinear mixed model that allow us to look at uh, the both combinations of random effects uh, and uh, fixed effects uh, are particularly powerful ways to approach these. We're working with colleagues that are uh, adding to that uh, Bayesian uh, statistical approaches that facilitate us having conditional estimation of, uh, of individual facts. So uh, a lot of tools available. Awesome. We have another uh, question. What about the current growth in metabolomics data collection? What kinds of metadata do you think will be required to maximally utilize it? So I think metabolomics and uh, obviously the other place that I spent almost no time talking about that are interesting in this context of microbiomics, but metabolomics, I think looking especially for disease like liver cancer or liver disease are going to be critically important because what's happening with with these cells uh, is actually quite commonly captured in what's happening uh, in their dynamic processes. Uh, so I would actually argue that metabolomics as it starts to mature and has to be able to be communicated is going to be an important dimension to our complex systems. What we're missing in metabolomics as we're missing in actually sadly much of biomedicine is a is a linga franca for the community to communicate with each other. Uh, so we're there are emerging sets of standards that would allow us to describe both the experiments and the way that we've captured data. But I think minimally uh, because meta the meta metabolomics is so much more dynamic than the genomic space, it's really critical that we 
know the both the experimental conditions uh, as well as the uh, the specific characteristics of the samples, their preparation, and other components in order to be sure that when we actually get a result from a metabolomic evaluation, that it's not a product of the um, that it's not a product of the experimental processing, that it's a product of the sample that went in. So those would be a few of the metadata. Okay, our next question. Is there a difference in complexity between hereditary cancer and sporadic cancer? So I think that's an excellent question, and actually one that ironically has been somewhat underexplored. Uh, there's been a speculation that, in fact, that uh, hereditary cancer should be simpler to study, and in particular, since we do know that there is, a, at least when we look within families, uh, there should be a, a common underlying uh, mutational framework that we could look at. Uh, so in some sense, it is computationally simpler. That said, as I started in the original presentation though, cancer unfortunately is not due to a single gene. So much of the other complex units around cancer uh, that are necessary, there's other biologic processes, uh, even though you may still have one or more of the phenomena, you still have a, a great deal of complexity. But but uh, actually, as a card-carrying geneticist, actually, I, I think one of the things we may need and would find value in is going back to family studies, uh, and in particular, hereditary cancers, because I think we may be able to reduce some of the complexity. Much of complexity analysis is all about controlled measurement of variability. In hereditary cancers, we actually would know at least one piece of the puzzle. It's a little bit like in solving a true puzzle, one of the things that's valuable to do is find a corner piece or a side piece. And by having studying hereditary cancer, we would have one of those corner or side pieces to help us build from. Super. We have a follow-up question from the audience member who was asking you about processing time series data. Are you open to collaboration on these data sets? So very much so. Actually, uh, it, I, I neglected, uh, I almost always actually end my talk with, uh, rather than having the acknowledgement slide slip, put up a slide that actually has both interested in collaborating and then having my personal information available for folks to uh, to reach out to me. So yeah, absolutely. We are always interested in finding folks that uh, have and have the potential to add unique insights to the data sets and uh, more than happy to have a discussion about how we might go about working together in asking and answering important questions against these data sets. Great, I'm sure you'll get some interest. We do have another question. What tool did you use in the pathway analysis? How did you achieve p-value? Which statistics? So we used actually, for the two sets of pathway analysis that I showed, we used two different sets of tools. Uh, the first tool set, and I'll, I'll, take, I'll point you back to the, uh, to the references I put in if you wanted to get more details, because it's sort of imperfect to do this in this form, was a tool called Pathologist. Uh, it was the core tenets of it were developed by my, uh, by my uh, colleague, Saul F. Roney. Uh, and the statistics associated with it, uh, I'll spend a minute to talking about, are, are worked out in a package. The actual analytic packages were developed uh, uh, by, a, by a, a Sharon Greenbaum, who actually also worked for us uh, when I was at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, the second package we used is PODA, a pathway of distinction analysis that was de developed by Rosemary Braun. Uh, so the the uh, pathologist analysis actually uses standard statistical methods uh, when we actually compute the pathway scores to evaluate the differences uh, between those particular magnitudes of the score. So tests not unlike uh, 
uh, not unlike t-tests, looking at quantitative variables that uh, uh, have pseudo-random variation. For the path, for the POTA analysis, because we're looking at very non-random data uh, and or non-normal looking data, we actually, again, use uh, non-parametric statistics in order to be able to evaluate these. Uh, but actually, the key uh, distributions and p-values of significance for the POTA analysis are driven by uh, computational resampling. So we actually uh, permute the data resources to generate a null distribution and then use those null, the empiric null distributions in order to evaluate significance. Great. We have another question from our audience. Does cholesterol have anything to do with breast cancer or is it only obesity? So that's an, a very interesting question. I, the, I, I apologize in advance to say I, I don't know enough of the interaction of the relationship between cholesterol uh, and breast cancer. It's been speculated because cholesterol is the precursor molecule for uh, many um, uh, types of both uh, hormones. Uh, it's a precursor for uh, many of the immune components that it certainly could be important, but I personally don't know that literature well enough to actually give a, a crisp answer to that, so my apologies. Okay, I think we have time. One more question. What examples of multi-omics integration yielding insights into HCC can you point to? So I think that that's a, uh, an important and interesting question. So, so to date, there's been actually very little integration of what we've seen uh, in multi-omics uh, in liver cancer, or to be honest with you, in most cancers. Most of the analytics that have been approached to date have been isolated in the either looking at nucleic acid somatic variation, uh, germline variation, uh, transcriptome levels of variation. And then in, in each of these, they, they actually seem to be studied in a single dimension. What I can tell you right now is at least in liver cancer, I'm not familiar with a multi-omics integration other than the ones that we are literally doing uh, that are happening in my lab as we speak. And I guess what I might encourage you to do is tune in to this, uh, come back to this channel, this station next year at this time, and hopefully I can actually share with you some uh, interesting insights that we get by looking at multidimensional data analysis in liver cancer. Awesome. Thank you, Ken. I'm sure I'll we'll be back. That's all the time we have. I would like to thank Dr. Ken Butow for joining us today and also to Roche Molecular Diagnostics for underwriting today's educational webcast and making it possible to be here with you. This webcast will be on demand man through March of 2016, and Lab Roots will be sending you an email alerting you when this webcast is available for replay. We invite you to share that email with your colleagues in case they missed today's live event. You can tune in on demand. That's all we have for now. Until next time, goodbye. <laughs>